button. So um, Dr. Smith is um, from St. Augustine or lives in St. Augustine, Florida. He has a PhD in early American history and Atlantic world studies, which is perfect for, the, for this series. Uh, he got that at the University of Florida. He's currently the museum director at the Jimenez Fatio House uh, Museum in St. Augustine, Florida. And several of us had the pleasure of hearing him talk for our second cup conversations a few months ago. Um, he is a, an excellent and engaging speaker and thoroughly knowledgeable. So I know you're in for a treat tonight. Um, Dr. Smith is also a professor of history at Flagler College in St. Augustine, probably one of the most beautiful college campuses okay. I've ever seen. Um, Dr. Smith serves on uh, the board of the Florida Council for History Education and uh, also was a consultant for the AMC television series, Turn, which is about Revolutionary War um, shenanigans. It's a great series. Um, it's, uh, he also was on the PBS documentary, The Secrets of Spanish Florida. Um, he recently got a national award from the Sons of the American Revolution for his work on Revolutionary War studies for uh, middle and high school classrooms. So um, he is, uh, like I said, an excellent and knowledgeable speaker. And so can't wait to hear from him. So we'll let you uh, start out, Dr. Smith, and then share your screen anytime. Okay. Thank you so much. It never ceases to amaze me how brilliant I sound when they let me write my own introductions. So, uh, so that was wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, if you've never been to St. Augustine, uh, it's it's a thrill, and it's uh, it's it's one of those towns that um, I was I think seven years old when I saw St. Augustine on the cover of National Geographic when they were celebrating their 400th anniversary. And uh, I remember thinking, if, if that's the oldest city in the country, then that's where I want to live. Took me another 46 years to get here, but uh, it, uh, it worked out well. And, uh, and now uh, I, uh, I not only uh, am the director of the Amenas Facio House Museum, but I always like to, to say that uh, this, this is, uh, like the Pattern Magazine, it is owned by the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America, this one in the state of Florida. And it was these ladies who, who uh, gave me the, uh, the money that I needed uh, to complete my uh, academic research for my PhD. So uh, I will always give the dames a shout out and uh, for the work that they do and, and uh, what they've done for me. But uh, let's go ahead and hit the deck running. Um, history wasn't uh, boring when it happened. I'm gonna do my best to try and not uh, make it boring tonight. And uh, let's see, let's go ahead and share the screen. Um, see if I remember how we did that. There's that. Oh, did, oh, well, current slide. Yay, okay, here we are. <clears throat> so we're gonna talk about um, <laughs> how unconquerable this city was considering that they had nine forts burned to the ground and were raided constantly by the English. So. So, so where is this unconquerable thing coming from? Uh, but we'll get into that. Uh, first thing that I want you to do before I, before I change screens, is I want you to get a visual image in your mind of what colonial America looked like. What would a map of colonial America look like in your mind? And I'm pretty sure that instantly something like this pops up. We see the 13 colonies and that's what we envision as, as colonial America. Here in Florida, it's a little bit different. Uh, when we look at a map of colonial America, it looks like this, uh, big buffalo. So you got the head here and the horns and the humpy back and the tail, and evidently it's a boy buffalo, but, uh, but anyway, it's all Florida. Notice that, and this isn't even a, a Spanish map. If you, if you look down here on the legend, it, it's, like, uh, it's like it's in German or Dutch and uh, talking about the Spanish and French in, in Florida and or in North America. And uh, so, so this, is, this is how they saw the, the North America at this time. And the reason why is because when Ponce de Leon planted his flag into the ground, said, I claim this land for Spain, he thought he was on an island. And so basically what he was saying was, everything my feet touch is now Spanish soil. 
Well, it didn't take them long to figure out that it's not an island, it's an entire continent. And the Spanish crown said, yes, that's exactly what we meant. We get the whole thing. So, uh, so all of a sudden, all of this land became Florida. And you can see Florida all over this map. There's a little bit of Canada and, and New France up here uh, kind of thing. But this is, this is how Florida started. We like maps in St. Augustine. Uh, this is, as a matter of fact, this is the Boazio map. It was drawn in uh, 1589 by an Italian cartographer named Boazio. And it depicts the 1586 sacking of St. Augustine by Sir Francis Drake. One of the things that's significant about this map is first, it's the, it's the earliest depiction of a, what, a city that uh, later became uh, part of the United States on a map. So St. Augustine is, uh, is the first city that we see found and depicted on a map. Secondly, this isn't just a map. This map tells a story. And in this map, you see uh, Drake's fleet coming into, uh, into the St. Augustine area. He can't get his fleet into uh, the harbor because there was a treacherous sandbar here that is, still gives us fits. You can't get past this. If you have a draft of uh, deeper than seven to 10 feet, depending on the tide. So he had to unload his, uh, his uh, smaller ships and put the, uh, put the army over onto Anastasia Island and get over to, uh, to this region where they, where they fought past one of those wooden forts. Once that was taken out, then the ships can, can, can the smaller ships can continue and come into St. Augustine this way. Uh, we learned fr from this uh, map, we learned what the, uh, the industry was in St. Augustine. Let's zoom in a little bit. And you can see this is an Asteria. It's a, a boat building facility. These two buildings over here are uh, the boat builders, the boat rights house, and also uh, his shop. We know what kind of boats they built because this boat is significantly different than the ones that Drake brought in. And if you, had, if you looked at the legend, this H here would say that it's a pinnace. Well, that's because the map is English. In, uh, in, to the Spanish, they called them a chalupa. Not the Taco Bell kind, but you know, the kind that, uh, that you sail to sea. Uh, so we know what the industry was in St. Augustine. Um, we also, let's see, moving the wrong way. Here we go. We also know that the mahi-mahi were much larger back then than they are today. Uh, have you ever noticed that when you have some of these old maps and especially when, the, when it's depicting the oceans and the seas, there's some crazy things out there. I mean, they've got Triton, they've got mermaids and uh, you know, Aquaman and, and, and all kinds of things out there in the ocean. Why? Well, ancient mariners. You have, you have these, these deckhands on some of these long voyages. They're not the most educated lot. And they're going into these exotic lands, exotic worlds across the Atlantic Ocean, into the Pacific Ocean. They're seeing things they've never seen before. So they get over to this region and they see something that looks like this. And by the time they make it back to Spain, it looks like this, okay? So, so they're trying to describe things they've never described before. Well, we run into a certain amount of mythology uh, with St. Augustine when you go back that far. And, uh, and, and part of it is the idea of the fortifications, its uh, defenses and things. But if you look at this map, don't look at the walls, look at the terrain. Look at the water all around it. I mean, Flagler filled all this in. Flagler College is right here. And uh, he filled all of this in, but all around this is nothing but swamp and, uh, and muck and quagmire. And uh, then you have the, the ocean and the harbor on one side. So as you look at the terrain, here you see an example of, uh, I like to zoom in a lot. Let's zoom in on some of this here. We've got, uh, if you brought an army down from Georgia, for example, you'd have to cross the St. Mary's River. You can't go to the west because you have the Okefenokee Swamp and the Creek Indians. So here, this is a, a map from uh, the 1760s when they built King's Road. And you can see it's skirting the, uh, the Okefenokee Swamp. And then they've got to cross the St. John's River. So they're getting, they're getting funneled to the, to the east toward the ocean. They get down farther and now they've got the St. John's River to the west. They can't go that direction. 
and the 12 mile swamp is funneling them even closer to the Atlantic Ocean. By the time the army reaches St. Augustine, they're popping out right here. There's no place else to go. And what they're getting is the defense works of the city. Up here you have Fort Mose, which by the way, was the first free black community in what is now the United States. It was established in 1738. In 1693, the Spanish crown uh, passed an edict that said that any English slaves who run away from, from their plantations in Virginia and in Carolina, if they can make it down to Spanish Florida, as long as they um, declare allegiance to the crown, join the Catholic church and join the militia, then they can be completely free. Well, that's a pretty good deal compared to what they had up in up in uh, Carolina. So, so they had Fort Mose here, and then running from Fort Mose to the uh, San Sebastian River was the Mose Wall. They hit that. If they got past that, then they're getting into cannon range from the Castillo. Now, to give you an idea of of uh, the dimensions of this map. From Fort Mose to the Castillo is two miles. So it looks like this really far and all this kind of stuff, it's not. But you get past the cannon fire and now you've got the horn work, which is running from more quagmire and muck over to the San Sebastian River. Get past that, then you're gonna hit the Kubo line, which runs parallel with the city gates and, and straight into the Castillo. All the way around St. Augustine, they had the Rosario line to protect it. And then everywhere else, it's quicksand, quagmire, ocean, uh, you name it, they're going to run into it. This gives you an idea of what they used to do with the, uh, with the defensive lines to help reinforce those. They dug canals between the San Sebastian River and Matanzas Bay to flood the area before you got to these lines. This is the Hornwork line. This is the, the Kubo line. And uh, Andrew Jackson did the same thing at the Battle of New Orleans. He dug trenches about, uh, about 15 feet wide, about seven to eight feet deep, took that dirt, piled it up on top, and put his, uh, his uh, earthworks there, and then uh, blew up uh, the, uh, the bank there of the uh, Mississippi River and flooded it. So the British were walking into that. <clears throat> so St. Augustine had the same kind of, uh, same kind of defense. It, was, it wasn't anything knew that Jackson had come up with. Here's uh, what the city gates look like today. You can see the, the original, uh, at least uh, the rebuilding of the Kubo line. I think these gates date to actually 1808. I'm not sure the dating of the uh, Coquina walls here. But you can see it's not really deep. It's just the idea that I've got to trudge through that to get to the, uh, the city gates, even after I've already been through three other defensive lines. Here with uh, St. Augustine is again, uh, as I was showing you, um, size is a little is a little bit of a uh, of a mystery here. This looks like a pretty good sized town, but if you stand over here, and I've got the uh, let's see if I can move this thing. Ah, I can, cool. Um, if I stand right here, and I take a picture toward the Castillo, it looks like it's a pretty good distance. Matter of fact, I'm going to aim for right here because I happen to know that there's a stop sign right there. And this is a corner. That's the cool thing about the city streets here. This, is, this hasn't changed. You can take this map and you can follow these streets and, and they all lead to the same place. They might have changed names, gone from British to Spanish, back to, uh, you know, it's, but it's, it's basically, this map is, is pretty accurate to, to today with a few exceptions. Um, so I take that picture, and to give you an idea, I'm standing uh, there where I pointed out, and there's my stop sign. It's about a block and a half. So it's not a big city by any means. Same thing. If I stand at this farthest point over here, and I go all the way across, and I'm looking for the highest point uh, of uh, the watchtower on the Castillo, bottom line is it's from here. And you can probably see this little little point right there. We'll zoom in again. And it's just not that far. It's a, it's a small city. The, uh, the historic city, uh, what you see here, St. Augustine, is 3.3, I'm sorry, 1.1 square miles. So it's very small. 
and, and easily defended in that regard. Now, let's look at what we have here. I'm gonna try and get this back over. Maybe if I put it over here, let's try that. Um, you get over here, this is the Kubo line. We know that's Coquina. And it's also uh, has uh, some, some uh, breastworks and uh, pine logs used uh, to build up the breastworks. This over here, this is pretty formidable looking. See all those spikes up at the top of the fortifications? Kind of kind of reminds you of Fort Apache, you know, kind of a thing with the sharpened logs and that. But but the real defense is out here. It's this muck, it's this mire, it's the quagmire, it's the the uh, the quicksand. Because this all right here, as uh, as formidable as it looks, in real life it looks like this. This is Cordova Street. The Flagler College and Cordova Street is where all the muck and the mire and the quagmire used to be. These are the earthworks that were built with the Spanish bayonet on top of them. And why did we only need some the, this kind of a fortification? It's it's simply because it was it was chest deep getting across this, and uh, it was it wasn't that hard to defend. Matter of fact, these earthworks right here. If you ever been to St. Augustine? You have, uh, this is the parking lot of Mojo's Barbecue, highly recommended. But uh, th these were built by British slaves in uh, during the American Revolution and they're still intact. So it gives you an idea of, uh, of, of how they built their defenses on this side of the, of the city. Um, over here, you have, uh, uh, again, the Spanish bayonet. You could lay on this berm here, poke your rifle or a cannon or something through the Spanish bayonet and just pick people off at will. And uh, so, so it, it, this part of this, this side of the city, the Western side of the city, um, that map, oh, that looks like it's, it's, it's just impenetrable. But uh, the bottom line was it was the terrain. It was the swamp that kept it that way. <clears throat> Here as you head toward the Castillo, and I saw that we have a, an NPS uh, uh, representative from the Castillo, so Rob, um, be kind, I'm probably going to get some of this compared to the knowledge you have, uh, I, I'd be amazed if I get all of this right. So, <laughs> so you, can, you can chastise me later. But uh, this is the extension, this is a reconstructed wall, the Kubo line, as it heads toward the Castillo. And uh, you can see it's uh, with the pine logs and, and that kind of a thing. Um, this is a view from the Castillo. You see the reconstructed Kubo line, the city wall coming out this way. These are some defenses that men could stand behind and, and fire. You can stand behind this line and fire. Um, get over here looking from a different direction. Uh, here's you, when you're standing behind this uh, fortification and firing. Now you're on the other side of the wall. You're shooting at men as they're approaching the wall to try and get in. This part here, this is interesting. Kind of looks like a... Uh, uh, a short par three or something, or a putting green down here. Here's the Castillo, and uh, but what is this? Because it's obviously a pretty good step down from uh, from being behind these defensive walls here. Well, this is a dry moat, and uh, you, you know the at one point they actually made the mistake of putting water in that. You're not supposed to put water. This is not one of the Disneyland you know castles or something out of. Uh, out of European castles. You don't put water in a moat like this. Uh, this moat was meant to be dry and uh, it had a very special purpose. You can see uh, how large it was and how, here's for perspective, here's some individuals down in the dry moat. Why, what was the good of a dry moat? It's where you put uh, livestock. It's where you corralled uh, cattle and goats and pigs and anything that uh, you needed to go inside the fort when a siege occurred. This was a siege fort. The idea was to, was to hold off the enemy, keep them at bay until uh, reinforcements could come from Cuba. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But uh, this is where they were allowed to graze and, and then, like I say, be brought into the fort. You can see, if you decided to charge the fort from the land, that's a tall task. That's hard to get up and they can shoot at you from any angle that they want to. But, uh, but that's if, if you wanted to approach it from that, from, from that direction. Here on this map, I wanted to show you that uh, what the Spanish plan was. 
Um, if if a, a invading fleet came in, you had a watchtower over here on Anastasia Island, they'd have to come in and, and the watchtower would let them know friend or foe. If it's friend, of course, no big deal. If they're foe, then the, the alarm went up and the first thing that happened was, was ships were sent out, smaller, faster ships were sent out down the Matanzas River and out what we call the back door, come all the way down the Matanzas River, which is, is uh, Anastasia Island is 14 miles long, and they could come out, go out the back door uh, at the Matanzas Inlet and then on to Cuba. Uh, round trip could be anywhere from six to eight weeks, depending on the time of year. Or the, or the weather or whatnot. But uh, that's, again, that's why at the Castillo, their job was to keep the enemy at bay. Remember, when Drake couldn't bring his fleet in because those, that crazy sandbar across there was keeping everything, keeping the larger ships out. So, so they could only really fire from, at the Castillo from out in the Atlantic. So the, their job was to keep the, uh, to keep the uh, everything, held up and bottled up out here. And there's over 270 shipwrecks out in this area right now. The group at, uh, at LAMP, it's the uh, Lighthouse Archaeological Maritime Program here in St. Augustine, they uh, dive on these shipwrecks all the time. <clears throat> and uh, it was an extremely difficult harbor to get into. Because like I said, the, the lighthouse was built right here. Uh, it's finished in 1874, you had to come in corkscrew around Anastasia Island and come into the harbor that way. By the time uh, an invading fleet did that, these guys were already setting off down the Matanzas River and out to, uh, out to Cuba. In 1740, the, uh, the Spanish realized that the British had caught on to their back door. So they put Port Matanzas down here. If we go back to this screen, it's, it's right, right about there where Fort Matanzas is. It doesn't look too powerful, too formidable, but that's a that's a very narrow neck right there to protect. You had to get past this ship or this uh, this fort, and uh, and it did it did the job uh, quite well in that regard. Protected Spanish ships getting out and uh, kept uh, from the British ships from coming in. From the from the ground level, the Castillo doesn't look like that much. It looks pretty small. Uh, as a matter, I mean, we saw down in the moat looking up, it's, it's, it's so tall. But the advantage of this is if you're sitting in a ship bobbing around like a cork out in the sea, out in the Atlantic, and you're trying to fire on this thing, there's not a lot to see. There's not a lot to, to, to get in your sights. It's, it's very low. Uh, nothing surprised me more than the first time I got up into the, uh, the lighthouse and I turned around, couldn't wait to see the Castillo. And it took me a couple of seconds to find it because it's just, it's not this big obvious thing that you expect it to be. As a matter of fact, because of the color of it, it blended into the background pretty easily. And uh, now the Spanish painted it white and uh, whitewashed it and uh, kept it that color. But now you get up into the, to the lighthouse and it, it's, it's hard to find, but that's good. Again, for defensive purposes, that worked out well. Here's the problem that St. Augustine ran into. If you, look at, if you look at the largest cities in the country, the old large cities, the, we're talking the East Coast uh, cities of you know, Chicago, uh, not Chicago uh, New York, um, you know, Baltimore, um, Charleston even, uh, Boston, East Coast cities with good deep ports. And they're all the old ones. Well, there's no older city on the East Coast in St. Augustine, yet we've only got about 13 to 15,000 people. What happened? Well, it's, it, was the, it was the easiest city in the, in the world to defend because of that harbor. You couldn't get the big warships in and things like that, but you also couldn't get the commerce in. You couldn't get the commercial ships in. And uh, what became our greatest asset defensively and militarily Became, uh, became our albatross when it came to growing and uh, becoming like the other, the other cities up the East Coast. Here's a view of the Castillo from the, from the sky. If you, if you did try and uh, come in and, and take this by land, you had a drawbridge here, you had a drawbridge there. And here in the, right here, this is a, a very large well, nice deep well with fresh water. 
Uh, here you can see the courtyard. Most people will look at that courtyard and say, oh, okay, so, so maybe that's where the soldiers threw their tents down or where they paraded. I'm pretty sure that when they brought all that livestock in from out here, this is where they grazed. Because you have to remember, the, a siege fort has got to hold out for an extremely long period of time. And the best way to keep meat fresh is to keep it alive. So you had, uh, had a lot of uh, <laughs> live animals out here during these times. And um, this, is, uh, this is an interior look of the Castillo. And uh, if I remember correctly, I believe they could store uh, enough food for somewhere between six to eight months. I know that General Oglethorpe gave up after two months trying to, to get it. He just considered it a complete waste of time at some point. This is my favorite view. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, over here, you can see uh, this is the entrance from the drawbridge. The ramp here, those steps weren't, weren't there. This is where they would, it was smooth. They'd pull the cannons up uh, onto the top uh, ramparts. I believe that's what they're called. I'm not a, I'm not a fort aficionado, apologize. Um, my favorite part though is right here. These are the bathrooms. They had, they had flushable uh, facilities in the Castillo. Now, how could they have flushable facilities? Well, it's not that hard. You just dig down deep enough until you hit a point where when the tide comes in twice a day, it, it flushes your toilets for you. So this was tremendous in keeping down uh, sickness and, and uh, bacteria and, and germs and that kind of a thing. So you could hold out in this fort for a long, long time and uh, certainly long enough uh, for the fleet to come in uh, and, and save the day from, uh, from Havana. This is the real hero of the story though. It's what the fort was made of, Coquina. If you're not familiar with Coquina, it is a sedentary rock formation. Uh, it's made of millions and millions of tiny seashells. They secrete an extremely large uh, amount of lime for their size, and they're packed and pressed, just like you would find a rock quarry. There are Coquina quarries. Anastasia Island was a very rich uh, vein of Coquina over there, and the Spanish knew exactly what to do with it, because they found coquina in Puerto Rico as well as in Havana. So uh, they knew how to handle it. It was when you got, when you take it out of the ground, it's soft, it's pliable. It, you could easily saw it into blocks and they would float it over to the mainland. And they uh, began uh, building the Castillo in 1672 and completed it uh, in 1695. But the coquina is the key here. Coquina, What's the best, how's the best way to describe it? Our house, the Administratio house, is made of coquina. And uh, because of, of, the, uh, of the formation here, it's porous. So it'll soak up table water like a sponge if you don't know what to do with it. That's why you don't put water in the moat. Um, in the summertime, it relaxes and breathes a little bit. In the wintertime, it tightens up and helps hold in the heat. But more importantly, Here's a, here's a cutaway of a, a big blob of coquina right there. <clears throat> Militarily, if, I, if you shoot a cannonball into granite or any other type of rock, just imagine it's, 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 like, it's like throwing a ball at a, at a mirror. It's going to crack. It's going to fracture and, uh, and, and send out you know, these fingerlings of, of uh, breakage. Coquina, you shoot a cannonball into this, and it, it breaks down, each individual shell breaks. So rather than the, the break expanding outward like you get on other uh, uh, concrete and, and uh, rock uh, forts, this one, it breaks in. And, uh, and therefore it literally absorbs the kinetic energy and the kinetic shock of a cannonball. And uh, now there's rumors that, the, that the, uh, the British would fire cannonballs at the coquina and it would stick and then the Spanish would run around and pull the cannonballs out and shoot them back. Trust me, Spanish soldiers knew that if someone's shooting cannonballs, you wanna stay in the fort. You didn't have to train them on that one. Uh, but what the Spanish would do, because a lot of times uh, the cannonballs would hit the coquina and bounce off. 
And uh, what uh, my understanding, what the, one of the things the Spanish would do is they'd, they'd come out at night and re-whitewash where the cannonballs hit and, uh, and perplex the, uh, the British the next day uh, because they couldn't tell what kind of damage that they had done. And, uh, but this is the real hero of the story is the coquina and, uh, and, and how, how it uh, uh, militarily, uh, what, it, what it did and in, in how it impacts uh, the city today. Um, it's kind of funny because I talked about unconquerable and St. Augustine has been anything but unconquerable. Um, it has, uh, it's been, we had nine wooden forts that were burned. Every time, <clears throat> about every 12 years, the English would come through here and burn St. Augustine to the ground. But once the Spanish court started loosing the purse strings and, uh, and, and, and let them build structures out of coquina, everything changed. Our oldest house in the oldest city in the United States it, it dates to like 1708. That's younger than 10 of our original 13 colonies, okay? That's not old, uh, but uh, that's because they, <laughs> the older ones were all burned down. The ones that, that are, are surviving from this era are the ones that were made of coquina. And again, that's why we have the fort. The, the city, the people would run into the, into the Castillo and, uh, and get sanctuary and, 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 and safety there and, uh, and wait out the siege and then go back and rebuild the city. That shows the tenacity and the determination. Um, a lot of people ask, why did the Spanish keep St. Augustine? It wasn't, there was no gold, there was no silver. Uh, there weren't even really any, a lot of good crops, but the King of Spain was a very, very devout Catholic. And <clears throat> he believed that the, the rapture would not occur until every soul had been evangelized. And he included Native Americans in that belief and believed that, uh, that St. Augustine would be the home to the, the mission chain, which we know happened. And that's what, that was the purpose of, of keeping St. Augustine and maintaining St. Augustine was for the religious purpose. But, uh, but that's, uh, those are our defenses. That was, that's what makes this walled city interesting. And, uh, and it, didn't, it didn't stop, even into World War II. The, uh, the Coast Guard uh, took command of the light station and uh, just up the coast of Ponte Vedra, where the German spies were, were put off by submarine and uh, were captured and that kind of thing. It's, this, is a, this is a wonderful town if you're looking for military history, Spanish history, Revolutionary War history. Uh, but uh, it all comes down to its uh, defensibility. Um, where it did become unconquerable is once the Castillo built, was built, the Castillo was never taken in battle, um, was never captured by the English, never captured by the British. Uh, matter of fact, the only time the Castillo was, was taken <clears throat> was uh, in, set, in 1862, Union gunboats, uh, a couple of them pulled up into the harbor and uh, a group came up to the Castillo, knocked on the door, said, we're here to take uh, command of your fort. And the, uh, uh, I believe it was a Confederate sergeant was, uh, was at the door and he said, well, okay, uh, I'm gonna need a receipt. And he made them uh, take inventory and give him a receipt so he didn't get in trouble uh, for, for turning it loose. But that's the only time the Castillo was ever uh, taken by uh, an opposing army and, and it was, uh, uh, man had the receipt to prove it. So he was okay. But uh, so I'm uh, <clears throat> gone longer than I thought I would. Good. Um, I don't have to start making stuff up. <laughs> Sometimes you come in short and you think, well, I got to make stuff up now. But uh, no, I'd be happy to uh, to open up. However, Catherine, you want to do questions or anything yeah, like that? Yeah, everybody. Um, we've we, uh, Roger, you've got a, a good fan club because uh, we've had some folks already. Um, say that they were so looking forward to hearing you speak. They're from St. Augustine. Uh, we've got some uh, tour guides in Charleston. I think one of the things that while people are typing up questions, one of the things that I would just ask, can you kind of speak to that relationship? Because we were talking earlier before we kind of let everybody in about Charleston and the Carolinians and the Spanish in St. Augustine. I think it was 
of all the world cities. And I want to say hi to Eric Thomas, who's uh, with Parks Canada. He's going to be talking to us later about Quebec. Um, I think uh, of all four of these walled cities that we're going to hear about in this series, Charleston and St. Augustine were the closest and had the most contentious direct relationship. So talk a little bit about, I guess, you know, we were talking earlier that when you hear about uh, history in Charleston, the English are the heroes of the day. <laughs> when you hear about, you know, comparable history in St. Augustine, the Spanish are the heroes of the day. So it really depends on kind of where you are as far as what story you get sometimes. Well, it's, it's kind of like people like to say that uh, um, Sir Francis Drake's raid on St. Augustine was a pirate attack. Well, that's only if you were from Spain. You know, the English saw him as, a, as an admiral. And uh, so it's a, it, it's perspective is everything. But no, the connection between St. Augustine and Charleston runs deep. Um, the, for example, uh, the Castillo was built. Uh, they, they began building it in 17, uh, 1672. Um, and it's primarily because the pirate, the, the one pirate attack that, that I'll stay, stand by and say we had, uh, Robert Searle came into town and he didn't burn the, the, the city down. He said, I'm gonna come back and make this my home base. And, uh, but it's also a little coincidental that uh, at the same time, broadsides were going out in London about this new colony of Carolina gonna come in just above Florida. And I wish I'd have thought to have it available. I have a map that was drawn um, that back in that time that showed the, uh, the, the southern border of Carolina being just, just below marine land down here. So that means the capital of Spanish Florida is inside Carolina. And at the same time, the Spanish northern border was up to just about, uh, um, oh, I'd say just below Charleston. So there was this lightning rod of contention, you know, as far as as who was gonna actually get that, that area in there that we now call Georgia. Um, but uh, so, so a lot of what was going on with just Charleston coming into existence gave them fits down in St. Augustine. And, and that's why one of the ways they struck back was say, fine, um, you, want to, you want to put a, a city up there and give us trouble, then uh, we'll offer sanctuary to any of your slaves who run away. And uh, so then the English, uh, the British came back and said, fine, we'll build Savannah and uh, make it even harder to get down, more British troops to get past on their way. And the <laughs> Spanish said, fine, we'll build uh, Fort Mose. And you know, it's a back and forth and back and forth until 1763 when, when we became, um, when we became uh, uh, British. And then all of, uh, then the contention in that regard went away. A lot of uh, trust, uh, what is it, Charlestonians? Is that right? Right, right. Wow, not bad for a kid from Oklahoma. Okay, <laughs> <clears throat> so a lot of the Charlestonians, um, they had contacts down here. They had uh, people down here. John Moultrie, who was Lieutenant Governor of, uh, of, of uh, East British East Florida during the, the term of Governor Grant, as well as Governor Tonin, he was, uh, he was born in Charleston. Um, Drayton, you have, we're all familiar with uh, Stephen, uh, what was his full name? William Henry Drayton. William Henry, right. Yes, down here we had his uncle, William H. Drayton. Oh, and uh, yeah, and uh, I've, I've now uh, uncovered some evidence to, I'm pretty sure William H. became a spy uh, under the uh, guidelines of uh, the guidings of some of the people up in Charleston. We see um, uh, Dr. Turnbull, who founded New Smyrna Plantation down here, and uh, Governor Tonin accused him of being a, uh, a uh, you know, a, a, a revolutionary. And he escaped to Charleston, and his son uh, was the lieutenant governor of, of South Carolina. And uh, one of the things they used against him, they said, well, he's a foreigner. He was, you know, because he was born in, in British held St. Augustine. Uh, the, uh, all of the, uh, in, 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 once the British took um, Charleston in 1780, uh, all of your prisoners of war came down to St. Augustine. And, uh, and so there's this, 
this close connection between the cities during the colonial eras that, uh, that uh, from the birth of Charleston on, it never, never really goes away. Well, I think that's absolutely true. And, um, and we've got good relationship now. We'll, we'll try not to go to war. <laughs> so um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, one of the things that, that strikes me about a lot of these fortifications that we're going to be talking about in this series are the sort of um, military engineering principles that go into it. And even, um, you know, certainly with, definitely with St. Augustine and Charleston in particular, and probably Bermuda as well, the, the landscape was so tough. The topography, you're, you're trying to use the topography, topography to your advantage, but you're also trying to shoehorn in a very designed fortification that fits in with military engineering principles um, like Vauban, you know, and when right. you look, especially at the area of the Castillo de San Marco, especially you think, wow, this is somebody really knew their military engineering. And certainly that's the case with Quebec and, and to maybe a little bit lesser degree Charleston, but um, even though it's vernacular, Charleston has really good, you know, when it's up as a, as a fortification, it has that good sort of baseline uh, fortification engineering. Do we know who designed the Castillo or, or well, what principles they were using? Is it Vauban? Yeah, no, the Spanish had, uh, had, had if you look at, I, I bought a book that has uh, uh, drawings of, of all of their uh, North American, not North American, but American capital cities. And they all pretty much have, I'm not gonna say the same plaza layout, but very similar plaza layouts. And it was, uh, it was something very Spanish that they did. They were very organized, they were set up on a grid. And, uh, and then always the fortification, it's some place where it made the most sense. Here, <clears throat> you know, if, if, you look, if you look at the map that I showed you, it's like the Castillo is way off in a backward corner kind of a thing. What's it, what's it doing way over there? And, but then when you look at the terrain, it's because the Spanish understood an army can't come in and end up anywhere else. This, right. is, this is where they're gonna be. <laughs> so they put the fort where you pretty much had to come up right in front of it. And then it was also closest to the sea so that it could, uh, it could watch over th that area and, and, and have the cannon fired to that area. And then again, I think uh, uh, to me, the brilliance of the fortification is not only if you get up and you look around, there's no place to hide. When you're shooting down from the walls of the Castillo, you can see everything. And uh, you couldn't get up close and high. But even at that, the brilliance of the Castillo to me is, uh, is, the, is, is the toilets. The fact that they, they had it close enough to the sea to where they could have fresh water on one side of the courtyard and a salt water flushing system uh, twice a day on the other side. And uh, it's, I, I, think, I think that's just fascinating. But, uh, but St. Augustine is, is a town that, uh, that went through a lot before it got to that point. And uh, the fact that, the fact that, uh, that we made it is, uh, is, is really fascinating. Absolutely. Well, I know that, what was it, this, uh, the Carolinian, the siege of St. Augustine, um, is it 172? That was one, uh huh. Right, <laughs> with James Moore, you know, he's attacking and attacking. He's burning down and laying siege to St. Augustine, and everybody's in the Castillo. He can't get to them, and and basically gives up. I'm sure it was fun as a victory because he burned the town, but he couldn't yeah. take that Castillo. One of the things that was interesting to me too was that there's this connection, uh, from what I understand. Um, the Castillo was, it starts to be built in 1672, is that right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that's just two years after the Carolinians have landed and trying right. to, you know, establish their settlement on the Ashley River. So no coincidence there. Right, for sure. right. <laughs> now it, uh, it I, I don't think it's any coincidence at all. And, and like some, the raid oh, by Robert Searle, of course, of course, played into that as well. 
Definitely. Well, we've got some comments um, instead of me just talking the whole time. So um, Allison Stevens said, thank you so much for the tour. The city was a vacation uh, spot in the 1960s. And that your talk brings back great memories and awesome information. Um, Payson said, um, did you mention someone named Drayton? Could you tell a bit more about him and connections to St. Augustine? I live on Drayton Island to the west of St. Augustine. Mm. Yeah, um, William H. Drayton was the uh, chief uh, justice during the British period, uh, 1763. Our British period is 1763 to 1784. William H. Drayton was the chief justice here. Um, it's 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 a crazy time. You have uh, you have in 1760. I'm gonna back up a little bit. In 1760, Lord Bute became the first Scot to be Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and he was one of the first to understand that at 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 the end of what we call the French and Indian War, that uh, that the Florida was was coming to be part of uh, a new colony. Uh, for the, for the for the British, and, uh, and and basically what happened, if you're not familiar with the story, um, the Spanish basically jumped in on the tail end of the of, of what we call the French and Indian War, in a in a way to help the French not be so vulnerable at the at the treaty, and so it's like let's give them a little bit little bit of muscle, you know, when they jump in. We know they're going to lose. That's a given. But we'll jump in and, you know, because we're family and we'll help them out. Well, the first thing the British did was capture Havana. And in Spain, now they're showing up to the Treaty of Paris on their knees. They're like, uh, they'll do anything to get Havana back. And the British said, well, you haven't done anything with Florida for 250 years, so we'll take that. And uh, they divided it into two uh, colonies of East and West Florida with the capitals at Pensacola and St. Augustine. So, uh, so when the British came in, Lord Butte jammed as many Scots into East Florida and West Florida as he possibly could, because the colonies were where uh, people went out and had the opportunity to, to go to, to make a name for themselves, make a fortune for themselves, come back to the British Isles and be considered socially equal to Englishmen. So that's why you see so many Scots in, in the British Army. Uh, Wellington, their most famous general, was, uh, was Irish. Uh, so, so it was very, you know, what's the word I'm looking stratified in that regard. And uh, I mean, Governor Tonin, who, was, who came in 1774, who was Irish, his complaint was at one time was that there are more Scots in St. Augustine than there are people. And uh, so it's it was just that kind of an atmosphere, and uh, and um, so Drayton, he and his group, when when Governor Grant left in 1771 to go back to Scotland, his father died. He went back to become the laird of the land. Then it's like high school or junior high. All these people started forming these little groups, and and Drayton and Turnbull, for example, like. I'll, if I get to be governor, I'll make you lieutenant governor. If you get to be governor, you make me lieutenant governor. You're that kind of a thing. That and, sounds like uh, Congress. <laughs> yes, you know, it's crazy. So, and then, and here in the midst, this, this goes on for three years. In the meantime, John Moultrie, the real lieutenant governor, he's been made the acting governor. Well, he's a full blood Scot, but he was considered a pretender because he was born in Charleston. He wasn't born in Scotland. So everybody hated him. You know, they're all right. after him. <laughs> sure enough, here comes, here comes Patrick Tone and on March 1st, 1774. <laughs> he's got the scrolls as I'm the, I'm the new governor and he's Irish. And uh, Dr. Turnbull stood up in the town plaza right in front of everybody, large crowd, and said, uh, I will not allow uh, my wife or daughters to associate with Mrs. Tonin. I knew her in Scotland and she was a whore. And... <laughs> The gauntlet was thrown. You know that's wow. if, you know why, if you want to know why Tonin brought down New Smyrna, there's there's your answer right there. <laughs> but uh, well, it sounds <laughs> like it sounds like there's a lot of fighting spirit. We do have a question from Eric in Quebec, and he wondered how many sieges Saint Augustine faced. Wow. Well, the first. I mean, the first that we're really aware of. Um, I mean, the 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 uh, 
the Tamuko got sick of them after about nine months. And because uh, the originals, if, if, if you've ever been to St. Augustine and you've never been to the Fountain of Youth Archaeological Park, go. It's, it's, uh, it sounds kitschy, but it is legitimately where the city of St. Augustine, this is where Pedro Menendez planted his flag and, and named St. Augustine. Uh, so that's where it all started. And uh, it took the Tamuco about nine months to get sick of them and, and run them off. But uh, so if you're not counting that, if you're just going to, to different seasons, I guess I would say Drake's was the first. Uh, I would have to guess how many. Um, like I say, we had nine wooden forts and all of them got burned down. So at least nine. And uh, got Charleston we, a few times. Yeah. The and then we know came in, in like 1702. I think he came back in 1728. Uh, but now he's facing the Castillo. Um, Oglethorpe tried to offload cannons onto Anastasia Island and bomb the Castillo from there. That didn't work. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to think uh, after 1740, I don't remember any. So a dozen at least uh, that are documented in that, in that respect. So um, one question, can you repeat where the remnants of the Rosario line are located? Yeah, that's, uh, if, if you walk down Cordova Street, uh, that's, uh, there's a, a, a block of where most, <laughs> It's, it's where Mojo's Barbecue is, and, uh, and their parking lot, <laughs> right behind it. And you, you can see those earthworks uh, right there. There's a historical marker. They, and like I said, they were built uh, during the, uh, the, the American Revolution by British slaves. One of the things that, that the British had the opportunity to do is they, they came into St. Augustine and just, and just repaired and refortified what the Spanish had already put here. Washington, so far I've found 81 letters, I was telling you earlier, where he cited St. Augustine as either a military target or a military concern, and Congress authorized invasions into St. Augustine five times. The reason that he was so bent on taking St. Augustine, number one, if he didn't like Canada on his northern border, he certainly didn't like the British in Florida on his southern border. Um, but he authorized, he kept, he kept pushing for these, these invasions because he'd never been here. And he didn't know what it was like coming into here. The Spanish fully <laughs> knew what it was like coming in to St. Augustine. And uh, I found uh, documentation of when the, when the fleet, the Spanish fleet in 1781 left Havana and, and, and uh, sieged uh, Pensacola, that a simultaneous attack was coming out of Havana and going to the east. And Washington writes, how excited he is that they're going to hit Pensacola and, and St. Augustine at the same time. But they didn't do that. They, the, the Eastern uh, Pincer went over and hit, hit the Bahamas. And, uh, and Washington was furious. But he'd never been to St. Augustine. The, the, the Spanish knew that they couldn't get their ships in there. They knew they couldn't bring an army in. They didn't even try. So um, Dennis would like to know if um, there's possibility that Fort Mose um, 1738 might have become the inspiration for the Stono Rebellion when you're later since the enslaved were trying to reach St. Augustine. Oh, absolutely. I think there's no question about that. The Stono Rebellion was in, in, one year later in 1739, and they were, they were caught heading south. Um, there's no question in my mind that they were, uh, they were heading, and it wasn't new that, uh, that, that slaves heading down to uh, F Spanish Florida would get uh, sanctuary that that'd been a reality since uh, 1693 but um once what's fort mose was was constructed then you, i i think then they be they got this sense of okay so this is this is real this is going to happen and this is going to sound silly i mean in in the united states you're not a real city or, until you get a mcdonald's okay in uh in in the spanish world back then if you got a priest you were official. You're officially a place. Right? Right. You got on the map and Fort Mose uh, got a priest and they had they had a, a church and it was it was uh, an official uh, Spanish town. And uh, and it was uh, like I say it was it was free. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that the Spanish didn't have a couple of things up their sleeves. Number one, it was two miles north of St. Augustine. So if an army's coming down from Georgia, guess who's getting hit first? 
and then they said they were a sentinel you know to send to send uh, re reports back to the to the town to get everybody into the castillo um, buys a little time <laughs> yeah you know there was uh, so there was there was that but uh but at the same time um hey it was it was like i say give me that or give me plantation slavery i i think i'll fight for this well speaking of the castillo um we uh, we had mitchell was wondering um it's so interesting to us that there's this there's a Castillo for a siege, and then there's the other fortifications around the town. Charleston had fortifications. We didn't have a, a citadel or a Castillo, although one was planned and one was presented, um, at, but it was deemed too expensive, so they <laughs> didn't go for it. Um, but Mitchell wants to know, how long did it take to build the Castillo, and, and do we know how many people it took or were there enslaved people that um, were used for the building of it? Do we know? Well, the first question, um, how long it took, they they uh, began construction in, in 1760 or 1672, and they completed it in uh, 1695. So what's that, 23? Someone help me, 23? A lot of stone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, as far as the labor, I'm sure there, uh, St. Augustine was, unbelievably diverse in and uh, if you ever want to find out how crazy the diversity is here look at uh, some of the writings of mike uh, um j michael francis and uh, <clears throat> he's done some research and found that in a uh, in a group that of uh, 2000 people that came into saint augustine a year after the city was founded um it included um not only spanish and portuguese uh but africans norwegians um uh people from all over europe and uh, you know the diversity here was amazing so as far as the labor goes um i'm sure there was native american i'm sure there was uh free labor i'm sure there was enslaved labor the spanish had a different attitude toward enslavement and then the then the the british did and the americans so <clears throat> just because you were here and of color didn't make mean that you were automatically enslaved but i'm sure that uh that there were free people, there were enslaved people, there were people of, of every ethnicity who uh, got involved because they understood the significance of what was being built and uh, the importance of it. They're the ones who had just recently been through Robert Searle's raid and now they're looking at Charleston coming uh, coming onto, onto the coast and they're like, yeah, let's pitch in, let's get this thing up and uh, okay. give us something to hide behind. Right. Well, um, uh, a shout out to Angela Bridges, who's our um, statewide president of the um, National Society of Colonial Dames in South Carolina, wondered how did the earthworks escape destruction in the building of the barbecue joint? And um, I will just say, you know, from visiting St. Augustine a few times, and you mentioned the Fountain of Youth Park and some of the archaeology, Shout out to St. Augustine on a fantastic ordinance that you have for archaeology. We're very jealous and we've been trying to do that in Charleston um, for a number of years and um, uh, just great archaeology all the way around it. Does that, did that help kind of identify the lines, uh, the archaeology yeah. program? You can't bury a dead goldfish in St. Augustine without contacting the city archaeology department. It just doesn't happen. Right. Um, here at the museum, uh, you it took me four months, maybe five months, to finally get permission a permit to <clears throat> to move my fence because it was falling down. I needed a new fence, and uh, I just wanted to move it about 18 inches off the curb, and uh, they put you through it. But uh, Mojo's is one of many, many, many companies that have been in the building that it's, it's occupying right now. Uh, and, and, but, but the city sees things like that. People get involved, historical markers go up, protection goes up. It's very thorough. Uh, once they realize that, oh wait, that's not just you know, a, a, a big bump in the grass. Wait a minute, where'd this come from? And when you have people like like Dr. Kathy Deegan uh, digging all over town, Carl Halbert, uh, the city archaeologist for so many years, um, things don't escape, you know, that kind of research. Our another, property. Another another great connection between St. Augustine and Charleston is that 
our fabulous archaeologist um, from the Charleston Museum, Martha Zierden, who's also on our Walled City Task Force, trained under Kathy Deegan in Florida sure. and still works a lot with um, uh, with Betsy Wrights in Georgia, who also trained with Kathy. So there's there's a great um, there's great stories archaeologically, yeah. and I think Martha and Betsy are even working on early cattle, and that's another that's another yes. whole lecture, but cattle thievery between the Spanish and the English was something that was very real um, raids for cattle for sure oh, even, but, uh, even during the American Revolution Thomas Brown used to uh, with the East Florida Rangers used to lead raids up into Georgia and uh, and and grab you know 400 500 head of cattle at a time drive them down through the Okefenokee swamp and and get them over to St Augustine and uh, it's a sad measure, but uh, one of the ways you, when you look at a colony back then to determine if it was successful or not was by how many slaves they were importing. Charleston was the uh, most significant port uh, during the British era uh, for slave importation. In 1775, um, the last record that I saw, I believe they imported three slaves during that year because of the turmoil. Governor Tonin writes uh, during the American Revolution down here in East Florida, he said, the Georgians come across our borders, they steal our slaves, we just buy more. So in other words, the economy here was booming. And uh, be because primarily the, uh, the Caribbean was in, uh, when the war broke out in 1775, when fighting broke out, uh, they were about five years into an eight year drought. <clears throat> and they needed, um, foodstuffs, they needed flax for clothing, anything that they, they could get from the Southern colonies. And by September of 75, every, every colony south of the Chesapeake had fallen to the rebellion. Even Georgia was, was uh, had, had their, uh, their governor on house arrest, except for East and West Florida. <clears throat> we had the, the naval stores here and the foodstuff to, to pick up about 80% of the slack. That, uh, that they lost from all of the other colonies in the South. So, uh, so the economy here was great, if you wanna look at it that way. <coughs> um, we did have um, from Judy Edgar, I think uh, her husband is a, would you say Oki, uh, Oklahoma <laughs> guy yes. from Lawton. <laughs> um, and I think Judy's joining us from Italy. Um, so we've got a very, it's a very international uh, lecture series. And um, Roger, thank you so much. I think that's just about all the questions. I know there's probably more, but we'll let people go. I, I really appreciate everybody coming today and especially uh, appreciate Dr. Roger Smith talking to us about St. Augustine. I hope that you'll join us again for the rest of these. Um, yes. I think What's really fascinating is all of these walled cities that we're going to talk about in this series, whether you come for a couple or the whole thing, St. Augustine and Charleston obviously have a great sort of connection, um, but we're going to hear about, and you know, Quebec, we're always so jealous of Quebec because <laughs> their walls are so intact and, and it is, you know, the most beautiful town, um, especially in the winter. Um, we're also going to talk about the fortifications of Bermuda, which isn't technically a wild city, but it's a bonus. And I think between the four places, we're going to learn so much about how all of these places interacted, how they stood alone, how they were alike and different, and how they protected European interests um, uh, in the Atlantic world. So we're very excited. Um, to continue this next week um, with Charleston. Um, we're gonna hear from Nick Butler, who's the smartest guy in town, another fabulous presenter, um, is gonna talk about the first phase of Charleston's fortifications. So we hope to see everybody then. And um, obviously you can always get in touch with me uh, at the Powder Magazine, and I can put you in touch with Dr. Smith if you have another question, um, or you can find him at the Jimenez Fatio House um, in St. Augustine. So we'll see everybody next time. Thanks so thank, much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.